Hi there, and welcome everyone. We want to welcome you to Climate Central's continuing webinar series on the science and impacts of climate change. For those joining us for the first time, a little word about who we are. Climate Central is a science and communications nonprofit organization based in Princeton, New Jersey, and our mission is to convey the science and impacts of climate change to the public. You can read more about us at climatecentral.com. Dot org. My name is Sean Sublin. I'm alongside my co-host just off screen there, Chief Meteorologist Bernadette woods Plackey. You're going to come on in, Bernadette? There she is. Bernadette's also the director of our Climate Matters program, where we work with media, meteorologists, and journalism professionals to support them in their efforts uh, to communicate the science of climate change and how it impacts them in their local communities. So we are very excited today to have a special guest with us. Uh, to help us guide us through Friday's uh, National Climate Assessment release. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, one of the lead authors of the NCA, joins us. Among her many important roles, Dr. Hayhoe is the director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech. She's the founder and CEO of Atmos Research, bringing, bridging the gap between science and stakeholders to help manage risk to clients and nonprofit, industry, and government. The American Geophysical Union awarded her the 2014 Communications Prize, and she's author of A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions, which puts the science in easy to understand English and tackles many of the science's misconceptions. And she hosts a tremendous online video series as well called Global Weirding, where she explains many of the finer details of the science and its implications. Catherine, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us on your busy schedule. Thank you, Sean. It's great to be here and great to see everybody. I see many familiar faces and names already. It is so, so fabulous uh, to have you with us. Now, before we turn over entirely uh, to, to Dr. Hayhoe, a few logistics I want to share. Uh, we've tried to default everybody's audio to mute because we have 216 people here and counting. Thank you all for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon. If you have a question during the presentation, uh, please use the chat function. Uh, and address your question to everyone. I'll be moderating the questions and we'll do our best to get to as many as we possible. We do have a 60 minute presentation, so we do have a hard out at the bottom of the following hour. So with that, Dr. Hale, if you are ready, I will release uh, present the sharing of the presentation over to you and you could certainly take from there. We'd love to hear what you have to say. All right, here we go. So I am happy to be able to talk not only about the first volume of the National Climate Assessment, which was released last year, but also volume two that came out this Friday. And in fact, this webinar is very serendipitous because it was scheduled long before we knew that the release date had been changed. So instead of just giving you a preview, I can actually get into some of the details. So first of all, Something that we often think about, something that we often fixate about when we see the headlines actually almost every week, is the number of people who don't actually agree with the science. And these are results from a public opinion poll conducted by the Yale Climate Communication Program. You can easily find this by just Googling Yale Climate Opinion. And it shows how across broad swaths of the country, there are many people who would not agree with the statement that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. Um, in fact, I actually wouldn't agree with that statement either, but I don't think my reason is the same as everybody else's. As a scientist, I know that there are no credible natural explanations for why we should be warming right now. We should actually be cooling according to natural factors. So I would say global warming is not being caused mostly by human activities. It is being caused entirely by human activities because if it were not from our emissions of heat trapping gases, we'd be getting cooler right now, not warmer. But that's just a little scientific quibble. So when we look at a map like this, where areas that are blue show more than 50% of people would say no to the question, we often think to ourselves, if they just knew the facts, surely they'd change their minds. And this is a little cartoon from one of our Global Weirding episodes on exactly this topic. Well, if we want facts, we have facts. This is the first volume of the National Climate Assessment that was released last November, so one year ago. You can find it online at science2017.globalchange.gov. Volume one goes through the science of climate change. In fact, it is currently the most comprehensive and up-to-date assessment of the state of climate science in the world. 
It was reviewed by 12 federal agencies. It was written by 50 authors, and it is almost 500 pages long. But don't worry, I can summarize it for you in one slide. The bottom line of volume one is that climate change is real, it is us, it is serious, and, and this is a really important addition because you don't normally see this in scientific reports, and the window of time to prevent widespread dangerous impacts is closing fast. Going into some of the details that this report provides, my chapter specifically talks about the scenarios. And contrary to what you may have heard from the White House, this report did not focus only on the most extreme scenario. It looked at the full range of scenarios, from scenarios where our carbon emissions somehow miraculously go below zero before end of century, to scenarios where we continue to depend on fossil fuels as our primary source of energy and carbon emissions continue to grow, consistent with what's been happening over the past 15 to 20 years. We looked at this broad range of scenarios in terms of carbon emissions, and then we translate that into an equally broad range of temperature projections, as you can see on the right-hand side. And we know from what this shows us that the biggest uncertainty in the future is, first of all, how much we are going to produce ourselves, and then second of all, how sensitive the Earth's climate is to this inadvertent and frankly unprecedented experiment that we're conducting with it. Volume one goes into detail on how unprecedented this is. CO2 levels have now passed 400 parts per million. They're currently pushing around 410 parts per million. Last year when we wrote this report, we said it was a level last seen about 3 million years ago. Since that, new research has upped that to almost 15 million years. So there was no human civilization around last time this was this high. And that's really important because it's not an issue of the planet, it's an issue of the fact that we have never seen this before. Why does it matter? Global average temperature and sea level was a lot higher back then. And if we continue to produce carbon emissions the way we have the last few decades, we would see levels that we haven't experienced in tens of millions of years and we can't find any analog to current conditions in terms of how much carbon is going into the atmosphere as far back as we look in the entire paleoclimate record. Was this report gonna change people's minds? If people didn't think the science wasn't real, if they didn't think that climate wasn't changing, was this gonna change their minds? I didn't think it was. In fact, when they asked me about this, I said, if someone's not already on board or they're just disengaged and they feel like it doesn't matter, more information about ocean acidification or extreme weather events is not what's gonna change their minds. And in fact, we know this from the social science. A study that was done five years ago by Dan Cahan, also at Yale, found that people who knew the most about science were not most concerned about climate change, rather they were most polarized about it. And in fact, subsequent work that Dan has done has showed that the smarter we are, the better able we are to find reasons to explain why the opinions we already have are correct. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Another study that Larry Hamilton, another social scientist did in New Hampshire, was he actually looked at whether people agree that climate change is happening due to human activities. He divided it out by what, I, what political party people affiliated themselves with, and he found very sadly that the more education people had, the further apart people were on their answer to this question. So is more information really gonna change people's minds? It isn't because people don't really have a problem with the science that explains why climate is changing. Is this information important? It absolutely is because actually the majority of us, about two thirds of us now in the US do agree that climate is changing and humans are responsible. So for those of us who already agree with the science, this is really important and vital information to have. But it's not information that's gonna change people's minds. And that's because the myth that the science isn't real or that it's somehow up for debate or a matter of opinion is not the most dangerous myth that the largest number of people have bought into. There is something that is just as pernicious, just as dangerous, that just about everybody believes. And it is the following. That global warming does not matter to me. 
It only matters to plants and animals, future generations, people who live in developing countries, the polar bear up in the Arctic, but it doesn't matter to me. Isn't this crazy? This is a map of people who say global warming will harm me, will, not is, but will harm me personally. It's blue across almost the entire country. And if you're wondering what those few orange counties are, those are predominantly Hispanic Catholics who are the most concerned people group about a changing climate. And if you're saying, well, of course they are because of the Pope, I'll just stop you there and say, well, actually white Catholics are the least concerned people group in the entire country. So there's a lot to get into there that I talk about elsewhere. But moving along, the reason why this is the case is because the number one image of a changing climate is an animal that just about nobody has seen in real life in the wild. I was speaking up in Nova Scotia in Canada a couple of weeks ago, and I asked a room full of scientists, of people who study this planet, how many of you living in Canada as scientists have actually seen a polar bear in the wild? And four of us, one of them being me, put up our hands. Not only that, but if it's about people, then it's always pictures of people who live far away on low-lying islands in the South Pacific where we've never been and we feel like it's a totally different world sometimes. The most dangerous myth that the largest number of people have bought into is the myth that climate change is distant, that it only matters to future generations or people who are far away. And that is exactly the myth that the second volume of the National Climate Assessment tackles head on. This is all about the impacts. This goes through every region of the United States. It goes through just about every sector of the United States water, infrastructure, transportation, health, agriculture, fishing, ecosystems, you name it. And it shows how climate is already changing, how it is already affecting us, and how people are already responding. So as you can imagine, volume two is a lot bigger than volume one. <laughs> It is the most comprehensive and up-to-date assessment, not of the science, that's already been done, but of how climate change is affecting the US and how people are responding to it. It involved experts and review from the same 12 federal agencies, but there was 350 authors and it is over 1600 pages long. But don't worry, I summarized it in one slide as well. <laughs> Volume two tells us that climate change is not a distant issue anymore. It's affecting every single one of us, no matter where we live in the US across almost every sector. And, and this is important, the more climate changes, the more serious and even dangerous the impacts will become. The report also says that we are starting to respond. We're starting to prepare, to adapt, to build resilience, and even we're starting to reduce our carbon emissions but it is not at nearly the speed that's required to prevent the most serious and dangerous impacts. We know that we're already vulnerable to really expensive and damaging weather and climate events. This is a map of the number of weather and climate events that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980. You can see that Texas is number one. In fact, this map is a couple of months old. We're already up to 105. Why do we care about a changing climate? For most of us, for just about all of us actually, a one degree or a two degree temperature change in the average temperature of the entire planet is virtually meaningless. I mean, there's probably more than a one or two degree C temperature change between where you're sitting right now and the room or the hallway right outside, right? So it isn't a case of the average temperature of their planet having an immediate and personal impact on our lives. It's the case that it's interacting with and exacerbating the natural risks that we already face, making many of them more extreme or more frequent or worse. The best analogy I have for climate change and how it affects us is that it's loading the dice against us. We always have a chance of rolling a double six, a really strong hurricane, a record breaking heat wave, a crazy drought or wildfire season. But now we're starting to see decade by decade, more and more double sixes show up. We're even seeing an occasional double seven. That's how climate change is weighting the dice against us. When we look at the ratio of record high temperatures to record low temperatures, we see that we still get record high and record lows. Last year, we actually broke over 10,000 record low temperatures across the US. 
but we broke over 30,000 record high temperatures across the US the same year. So we're seeing more frequent high temperature extremes. We're also seeing more frequent heavy precipitation events. If you look around the whole US, the Northeast and the Midwest have seen the greatest increases since the 1950s in heavy precipitation events. And both extreme high temperatures and extreme precipitation are virtually certain to increase in the future with the note that climate models tend to underestimate observed trends, especially for the increase in extreme precipitation. So an argument that we often hear is, you know, aren't your climate models biased? And my answer is, well, for most stuff, they're pretty right on, but yes, they can be biased sometimes, but did you know, did you understand that they tend to be biased in the direction of underestimating rather than overestimating observed and projected change? And that's not really good news. We also see that phenomena like atmospheric rivers are being affected. Atmospheric rivers are a natural phenomena. They supply 30 to 40% of the rainfall for many Western states and Western provinces up in Canada. But the warmer it gets, the more water vapor the air can hold. And so we expect to see that the frequency and the severity of these literal rivers of water vapor in the sky that just dump rain on the coast when they reach it are going to increase in the future. What about hurricanes? We aren't seeing more frequent hurricanes. I know there's a lot of discussion about that, especially after the season that we had in 2017. But long term, we aren't seeing a change in the number of hurricanes as the planet warms. In fact, in the future, we might even see a few less hurricanes as the conditions conducive to hurricane formation actually decrease in a changing climate. But that's the only good news we have because the rest of it's all bad. We are seeing that hurricanes are getting stronger. Tropical storms, cyclones, um, typhoons, and hurricanes are unique in that they get their energy from warm ocean water. And 93% of the extra heat being trapped inside the climate system by all the heat trapping gases we're producing is going into the ocean where it can power stronger storms. So they are intensifying faster. They are stronger and bigger and slower which means they can sit over us for longer and dump more rain. And the biggest change that we have seen in hurricanes is that there's much more rainfall associated with them. In fact, in volume two, we update the hurricane research with a bunch of new studies that came out after Harvey. And we find that because of human induced climate change, the, a storm the size of Harvey is now three to three and a half times more likely than it would have been 100 years ago. And there was about 40% more rainfall associated with Hurricane Harvey today than there would have been 100 years ago without a change in climate. That's a big impact. The second volume of the National Climate Assessment goes through every region. And I wish I had time to go through every region in detail because there's so many unique aspects to the way that climate change is interacting with and exacerbating the risks that we already face in the places where we live and the iconic things that make our region our region. So in the Northeast, we could talk about how climate change is affecting the fall colors, the maple syrup harvest, the snowmobile industry. But just one example is this very, very um, evocative um, picture from Maryland showing how high tide flooding has already increased by a factor of 10. So it is 10 times more frequent now than it was 50 years ago. That's pretty stunning, isn't it? We expect it to be as many as 30 days a year. So this could happen as many as 30 days a year in the future for 20 cities along the coast in the Northeast that they studied, even under a lower scenario. The scenario where again, by some miracle, we go negative carbon emissions before the end of the century. Even then we could see 30 days like this. It isn't just what's happening in the Northeast, it's happening down in the Southeast as well. These projections are for Fort Pulaski near Savannah, Georgia, showing the number of days per year. So that's what you see on the, on the y-axis there. The number of days per year when there would be high tide flooding under a, a straight line trend scenario, which we know is not likely because sea level is now rising twice as fast today as it was 25 years ago. So that's an exponential increase. It's not a linear increase. So really the blue, the, the dark blue is the lowest case scenario. So by mid-century, we could be at 100 days of high tide flooding. And under a more extreme scenario, they could be at 300 days of high tide flooding by mid-century. This has a huge impact. It has a huge impact on the ports, 
on the naval bases, on the wastewater treatment plants, on the expensive real estate and vacation homes that lie along the coast. In Florida, in some areas, they've showed that properties right on the coast have already dropped in price by 7% relative to their neighbors just a few blocks in land. But it's also having a profound impact on people who have lived in these locations for centuries. Believe it or not, we already have climate refugees in the United States. And some of the tribal nations in Louisiana are the first of those refugees. As their low-lying land is being eroded as well as being overtaken by sea level rise, they're talking about it, and this is an actual picture from the report here, the people from, I think it's Ile Jean de Charles that is the name of the, of the island. They're actually talking here in a community meeting about what they can do to move their community somewhere else because they will be losing it due to sea level rise, land subsidence, and erosion. In the western states, the headlines the last couple of weeks have been dominated by the extreme wildfires. California broke the record for the most damaging and biggest wildfire on record last year. That record was broken earlier this year and it was smashed the last few weeks. So the three biggest, most damaging wildfires in California have just occurred in the last year, uh, most of them I think except for the first one, after this report was written. So even though this report was written after two of the three most damaging wildfires in California, the cover of this second volume is a cover of people watching a wildfire burn its way down a hill. And one of the most stunning results, I think, is the fact that it shows that the area burned by wildfire, so if you look at the, at the left-hand axis, it's the cumulative forest area burned in millions of acres. The area burned by wildfire today is almost twice what it would be without a changing climate. We're seeing changes all around. Up in Alaska, one of the biggest changes that's happening as it warms at twice the rate of the lower 48 is the fact that what used to be permanently frozen ground is crumbling and thawing and falling into the ocean. On the left-hand side, you see a map of the permafrost, again, what used to be permanently frozen ground that expected to be thawed by 2050 in red, by 2100 in orange. Why do we care about that? Because a lot of infrastructure, homes, buildings, airports, oil pipelines, are actually built on this permafrost. And so there's even a company that's actually created these cooling tubes that you can embed into the permafrost to try to keep soil temperatures cool enough to keep it frozen. And towns and cities are buying them, but oil companies are buying them too to try to stabilize the area around the oil pipeline so they can continue to pipe oil in a warmer world. The irony is sometimes really stunning. We're seeing these changes also on the islands, and there's one chapter on the Caribbean as well as one chapter on Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. Why do we care about it? For many reasons. Islands depend on rainfall for their, for their water supply, and many islands are looking at decreases in their rainfall due to a changing climate. They're also combating stronger storms, as we talked about, as well as rising sea levels that can inundate everything from major airports to incredible priceless cultural heritage sites. Even here down in Texas, we are already and we will continue to experience the impacts of a changing climate. Here in Texas, we suffer from the whiplash effect. So in a, you know, normally, wherever you live, your weather kind of looks like this, right? Hot, cold, wet, dry. If you live in Texas, our weather looks like this, hot, cold, wet, dry. But even in Texas, this natural pattern of extreme variability is getting stretched by a changing climate. The warmer it gets, the more frequent are heavy downpours. Yet the warmer it gets when droughts come, they're stronger and longer. We actually just published a new study a couple of weeks ago, too late to make it to the National Climate Assessment, that showed how the high pressure system that sits over our region during droughts in the historical period that high pressure system is gonna get stronger and more frequent in the future as a result of a changing climate. And it's primarily driven by a self amplifying feedback from warm ocean temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. The exact same phenomena that is driving stronger hurricanes, which contributes to our record breaking rainfall on the coast as well. Of course, this is no surprise because the number one reason again that we care about a changing climate is because it takes the risks that we already face today and it amplifies them or exacerbates them. 
And Texas is already one of the most vulnerable states in the entire country to naturally occurring weather and climate disasters. So ironically, it is also one of the states that is most vulnerable to the impacts of a changing climate. Why do we care? We care because climate change affects us. But then there's this, and both the first and the second volume of the National Climate Assessment get into this a bit. It's very unusual to start talking about policy. Usually we, we scientists run a mile rather than talk about policy. And these reports are not policy prescriptive. They don't say here's what you should be doing, but they do go as far as we can go with the science, which is they say, you know what? If we want to meet a global two degree target or a one and a half degree target, then the science can absolutely tell us, here's the carbon budget we have to work with. So the first volume says, if we want a 66% chance of meeting the two degree target, and 66% is not that great. I mean, what if you had a 66% chance of the airplane successfully arriving at its destination? Would you get on the airplane? Probably not. We're talking about the only planet we have. There's no other planet to go get on right now. But anyways, if you just wanted a 66% chance, because as scientists we're very conservative, of meeting the two degree target, our cumulative emissions would have to stay below 800 gigatons of carbon, and that includes other gases, greenhouse gases as well. Assuming, and again, we're very conservative, assuming that global emissions followed a lower scenario, RCP 4.5, this would give us about 20 years worth of emissions before we hit the limit. But the observed increase in global carbon emissions over the past 15 to 20 years has been consistent more with a higher scenario, which would give us only about a decade or so before we hit that limit. Now, is that a hard limit? Does that mean that, you know, if we hit 800 gigatons, it's all over, we should just give up? No, absolutely not. And if we end up at 1.999 degrees, it doesn't mean everything's A-OK. -okay. If we end up at 2.001 degrees, it doesn't mean we're all going to hell in a handbasket. It's like there's no magic number of cigarettes that you can smoke before you get lung cancer, but we do know you don't have lung cancer yet, so the best time to quit is now. That's basically what this is saying. It's saying, hey, the more climate changes, the more carbon we produce, the higher global temperature increases, the more impacts we're gonna experience and the more costly it's gonna be. And this is where the third report comes in. Now, you may not know this, but last Friday, when the second volume of the National Climate Assessment was released, another report was released the same day. It is the second state of the carbon cycle report, and you can find it online at carbon2018.globalchange.gov. Now, this is very relevant because why is climate changing? The number one reason is because by digging up and burning coal and gas and oil, we are disrupting the natural carbon cycle. So this report talks in great detail about where the carbon is going in the system, how much we're digging up and burning, how much of it is going into the biosphere, how much of it is going into the ocean. But I think one of the most interesting aspects of this report is the fact that it tackles the elephant in the room head on. It estimates that the cost of reducing emissions to meet the Paris target for the US alone is between one to four trillion dollars total. That's not per year, that's total. They also note that it doesn't include the co-benefits. There are enormous co-benefits to reducing fossil fuels. In fact, from the perspective of co-benefits alone, the impacts on our health and on lost work days and on the environmental degradation and pollution that's caused by mountaintop coal removal and by burning coal, because of the co-benefits alone, coal has not been economically feasible or viable for over 20 years. So why are we still using coal? It's because the people who pay the price are not the people who make the profits. So without considering any co-benefits at all, just considering the actual cost, it would cost the US between one to $4 trillion to meet the Paris Agreement, which sounds like a ton of money, right? Let's break that down. Today, the US GDP is, about, is almost 20 trillion each year. That's a year. So reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement would cost between one, or sorry, between 5% to 20% of just one year's GDP. And of course, nobody's talking about doing it one year. We're talking about doing it over a couple of decades. So we're talking about a fraction of total GDP. 
Okay. So what if, you know, what if we did it in 20 years, which would be super fast? That'd be 1% of the GDP maximum, a quarter minimum. But here's the thing. What's the cost if we don't reduce our emissions and we continue on our current pathway? The cost is estimated to be somewhere around 200 billion per year. The report actually says between 175 and 205, roughly. 200 billion per year. So if it costs 200 billion per year, that would be basically five to 20 years for payoff. Right? One to two trillion dollars, 200 billion per year. But here's the thing. By 2100, climate change could be costing the US 1% of our GDP per year. 1% of our GDP today is 2 trillion, or sorry, 200. Gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking. This is terrible. 1% uh, of our GDP, so our GDP is 20 trillion. 1% uh, is 0.2, 200 billion too. So that would, sorry, still be five to 20 years to pay off. But here's the thing. The thing is, is when you look at other countries around the world, other countries around the world, they're looking at a 20 to 25% loss in their GDP per year. And those countries are some of the poorest countries in the world, countries like Cote d'Ivoire or Indonesia. So the bottom line is, by any objective economic analysis that considers the costs and the benefits over at least 20 years or longer, actually probably only 10, but we like to be conservative, the Paris Agreement makes economic sense for the United States. And the Soccer Report, which is a report that you've probably never heard of, the Soccer Report actually shows this. So the headlines that, have, that we've seen the last couple of days. It's cold outside, therefore the planet can't be warming over climate time scales. The White House says the dire climate report is based on the most extreme scenario. Well, as you saw, again, when they talk about sunny day or high tide flooding in the Northeast, they're talking about results from the lowest scenario, and even then we'd be seeing 30 days a year. Um, and then, of course, just the other day, Rick Santorum was like, climate scientists who wrote this report are driven by the money. I received zero dollars for writing this report. My salary would be exactly the same if I'd never written this report, but I think I would have published at least eight more journal articles and probably submitted a couple more grant reports, which would actually pay for my students and postdocs, as opposed to the National Climate Assessment, which paid for zero. So when we see all of this, we often say if they just knew the facts, they change their minds, right? But the reality is, as I talk about in all of our different global weirding episodes, and you can find them here on YouTube, the reality is, is that we don't think this matters to us. And so that's why the second volume of the National Climate Assessment is so important. Because it shows that no matter where we live, no matter who we are, no matter what we care about, the very person we already are is exactly the right person to care about a changing climate. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much for taking the time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to leave pro uh, control of the presentation with you for the moment. Uh, I do want to uh, attack a few questions and give you the opportunity to, to access your slides for everyone uh, as, we, as we go forward. Um, first question is, how do you respond to an individual when they ask you, what does climate change mean to me? You, you kind of teed that up a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so, first of all, I want to make sure I know who I'm talking to. So if I don't know them all that well, I'll, talk, I'll ask them, you know, what type of things do you care about? You know, let's just talk about who you are, what your life is. Are you, you know, do you farm? Do you ranch? Um, do you live in a big city? Um, are you conservative? Do you care about national security? Are you concerned about the future of the economy? What about, um, you know, American innovation and competitiveness with China? Figure out what makes somebody tick. That's the first thing. So the first step is actually listening, not talking. And then once you figure out what makes somebody tick, then we can connect the dots. Um, you're a parent, you care a lot about your kids. I care about my kids too. Did you know that climate change affects our kids' future? And then give them you know, a specific example from the place where you live, which you can get from the National Climate Assessment, about how climate change is actually affecting our kids' future, whether it's the economy, um, whether it's their health, whether it's air quality, um, and especially whether it's, it's affecting people in other countries as well. Um, you know, you, you care about national security and you're a part of the military. 
Did you know that the military calls climate change a threat multiplier? It takes all the issues that we're already concerned about and it makes them worse. And so from the perspective of national security, what is a better idea than weaning ourselves off the old and dirty ways of getting energy that are supplied by countries that are not friendly to the United States and instead generating our own clean homegrown energy right here at home where we keep the jobs in the US. So it's really important to figure out where people are at and then connect the dots between climate impacts and climate solutions that they would care about because of who they already are. Uh, I'm a fan of, of taking from your playbook and saying to meet people where they already are. So uh, it's a wonderful strategy. Uh, another question we had was, could you elaborate a little bit more when you say that the climate models actually tend to underestimate impacts? Yes. Uh, so we actually have a global rating episode that just came out a couple of weeks ago on that, if you want, it goes into a bit more detail. But what we see with our models is, first of all, if we as scientists are not 100% sure about how to put something into a model, it isn't in the model. So in other words, we don't account for the fact that we understand Antarctica is melting faster than the models say. And we actually know it's because of ice cliff instability. But we don't understand the mechanism well enough to put the exact numbers on it to put in the climate model. So as a result, our estimates of sea level rise are too low because they don't include a process that we know is real, but we don't feel confident enough in to include in the model. So our default is zero, which unfortunately always tends to err on the side of caution and underestimating rather than overestimating. Now, the really scary thing, and we look at this in chapter 15 of the first volume, is that when we compare what our climate models show us with what happened during paleoclimate periods a long time ago when it was warmer than today, the data consistently shows that temperature and sea level rise was substantially higher back then than what the climate models predict it would have been. So that is very concerning because it leads us to conclude that when we look long-term, not over decades, but over centuries, it is more likely than not that our estimates of what's gonna happen long-term are lower rather than higher than what's actually gonna happen. Excellent. Uh, another question, congratulations. It starts, congratulations on your work with a faith-based community. Do you have any lessons from, from that outreach that could be applied more broadly? Yeah, the number one lesson is the one that you and I just started talking about at the beginning, Sean, which is the lesson of meeting people where they're at and recognizing that just about everybody already has the exact values they need to care about a change in climate. They just haven't connected the dots. So many people say, you know, how do you talk to those evangelicals? And it's true. A lot of people who call themselves evangelicals don't even go to church. It was estimated, I think, that 50% of the people who called themselves evangelicals and voted for the current president don't even go to church. So those are people I call political evangelicals. And if you're talking to political evangelicals, you know, that's a whole different set of values. But if you're talking to people who actually do go to church, who actually do read the Bible, then the best place to start connecting the dots between their values and a changing climate is with what it says in the Bible. And you can start with Genesis, where it says God gave us humans responsibility over every living thing on this earth. And then you can talk in more detail about how we're told to love and care for those who are less fortunate than us and how people in the poorest countries of the world are suffering first and foremost from the impacts of a changing climate. But this lesson is completely generalizable because people often say, well, you know, I'm not a, you know, I don't go to church. That's just not what I do. How am I supposed to talk to people? And my answer is talk to people who share your values. Uh, do you care about the, um, the place where you live? You can talk to people who live in the same place as you. Are you a birder or a fisher or a hunter or a skier? Talk to people who care about those things. It's very powerful to tell people that the Baltimore Oriole might not be native to Baltimore anymore as climate changes. Uh, it's really powerful to talk about the changes, the impact in the snowmobiling industry in the Northeast, which a lot of small towns depend on for their winter economy. Uh, if people are concerned about water, if people are concerned about food, if they're concerned about the economics um, of clean energy, there's a lot of different ways that we can connect and it all starts with getting to know the person or the people that you're talking to. Absolutely. Um, good advice. No question about that. Uh, another more sometimes thorny question is, is beyond doing political advocacy and, and personal carbon you know, reduction, recycling and driving fuel efficient or electrical cars, where may be the best place to invest time and money from an individual standpoint? Or is that something you can feel comfortable answering? 
<laughs> um, well, no, I mean, because that's the obvious question. Like, imagine if you went to a doctor and you've been running kind of this, this consistent fever for years now that went up and down and up and down, but gradually up. And then the doctor runs all these tests and diagnoses it and tells you what the problem is. And then imagine if the doctor just folds their arms and sits back in their chair and says, okay, I'm done. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do about it? And the doctor's like, oh, I don't know what you're supposed to do. I just told you what the problem is. So even though solutions are not my wheelhouse, I, we're really good at diagnosing. You know, we're not so good at fixing. That's not what we do. We still need to educate ourselves on what the solutions are. And the number one most important thing for any of us to do about this is talk about it. Because when they've surveyed people, it turns out three quarters of people in the entire country don't even hear somebody else they know talk about it more than once or twice a year. Why would we care if nobody talks about it? So the most important thing we can do is talk about it. Not necessarily, you know, definitely not starting an argument with Uncle Joe over, you know, sunspots and volcanoes. No, talking about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. And so I, I personally reduce my carbon footprint. I'm always thinking of new ideas that I can do. Um, I'm really excited about my new drying racks right now. But the whole, the whole reason that, um, that I reduce my footprint is, first of all, to be a good steward of my resources, to walk the walk and talk the talk, but to have things that I can share with other people, to talk about what I'm actually doing. That's something to talk about. And then when we do things personally, that affects our own attitude and our motivation. When I'm actually making a difference in my life, then I care about it more. I'm more likely to have the conversations, to talk to elected officials, to vote, to meet with leaders and say, hey, we should really do something about this. What can we do to prepare for a changing climate and to wean ourselves off old dirty ways of getting energy we've been using since the you know, middle ages. We really have been using coal that long. We're more likely to have those conversations when we're making the changes in our own life. So it really does start at home, but in a bit of a different way than we might expect. Yeah, I remember the old, the old adage, you know, um, I think it was um, think global, act local. And it mm -hmm. kind of goes from there. Um, let's dive back a little bit to the recent IPCC 1.5 report. A couple of people have said they've heard conflicting uh, information in the media about how long we have before we, uh, before we, the, the worst effects are really unavoidable. Uh, what's your comment on that? So I'm not, as a scientist, a big fan of putting dates on things because it contributes to that effect that I said. It's like, you know, if, if we make it by then and we do what we're supposed to do, everything's going to be fine. And if it's January 1st, past November or past December 31st, and we didn't make it, then it's all, we're all screwed. That isn't the way that the science works. The way that the science works is that the more carbon we produce, the greater the risks. It is a sliding scale. And the further we go into the future, producing more and more carbon, at that point, the greater the risk of tipping points where we might see abrupt change into an even, you know, a different climate state. And we do talk about this again in chapter 15 of volume one. But it isn't a case of if we haven't done X by Y, it's all over. And why that's so important to recognize is because fear and panic are not going to fix this problem. When we panic, it's really good for motivating short-term action. But short-term action isn't going to solve climate change. To solve climate change, we need long-term sustained action over days, months, weeks, years, and decades. And to sustain that type of action, we need hope. We need hope for a better future, hope that our decisions, the choices we make today can actually change the future. And for me, that's the most hopeful part of the science I do because I actually document the difference between a one, two, three, or four degree warming in degrees Celsius, looking at global temperature, but saying this is what it means for drought in Texas. This is what it means for heat waves across the Midwest. This is what it means for corn yields in Iowa. By documenting those changes, we can show that our choices do make a difference. And um, if we end up at three degrees instead of four, we are going to save ourselves some dangerous and serious impacts. If we end up in at two or even 2.5 instead of three, we're still better off. Of course, if we can get below two or even one and a half, we're going to be much better off. But it is a sliding scale. It isn't an abrupt, you know, if we don't make it to this by this, it's all over. Well, uh, kind of expanding on that, you know, it's not either or one or two, zero or ones, but mm -hmm. we still have these, these, these tipping points that can, that can be reached. Can you, can you speak to some of the, the tipping point risks that may be out there? Yeah. So tipping points is something that kind of dominates the public discourse since the day after tomorrow. 
terrible movie. <laughs> um, it is not scientifically accurate. Um, even if the entire Gulf Stream shut down, we would see a rearrangement in the heat distribution on the planet, but it would not immediately plunge the Northern Hemisphere into an ice age at all. Um, at best, it would help Northern Europe out just a tiny little bit compared to the overall amount of global warming. At the same time though, tipping points are real. We know they exist because they have happened in the past. These tipping points include things we might not think of as tipping points, such as an ice-free Arctic in summer. That would fundamentally change the dynamics of the system to where we would be seeing a very different response under those conditions than we see today. Uh, other tipping points include large-scale forest die-off, um, again, changes in the uh, ocean circulation, changes that when they occur, would take that part of the Earth's climate system into a different state that would respond differently to a warming uh, climate. So we don't know exactly when these will occur because we have never poured so much carbon into the atmosphere so fast before. And as far back as we can go in the paleoclimate record, we've never seen this much going in. The, the most extreme time of change that we can see back you know, over 50 million years ago, we, the, the best estimates are that about a 10th of the amount of carbon was going into the atmosphere at that time per year as is going in today. So that's why we can't put an exact number or a date on when a tipping point would occur. But we can say this, the further and the faster we kick our planet into uncharted territory, the greater and the more imminent the risks of actually reaching one of these tipping points. Mm -hmm. And staying with that ocean theme, um, we had one other question that said, uh, you know, the increased temperature and acidity of the ocean uh, do not seem to be discussed as much uh, could you explain a little bit more impact on corals, mollusks, shellfish, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Well, so in volume one, it's actually discussed quite extensively. So if you're interested more on the ocean, go to volume one, and there's a whole chapter on the ocean where it doesn't just talk about acidification. It talks about the warming of the ocean and the deoxygenization of the ocean, which honestly, I wasn't even that aware of until I was working on volume one, because that's not my area of expertise. But the emerging science is clear that it isn't only about CO2, it's a trifecta of warming temperatures, increasing uh, carbon dioxide concentration, and also decreasing oxygen levels in the ocean, which of course, everything needs for life, whether you're a coral or fish or a human. So a lot of the bleaching that we've seen in recent years, for example, the famous bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef just a little while ago, that is occurring primarily due to warming temperatures but it is exacerbated by ocean acidification and by pollution and runoff from coastal communities as well. Um, so they're all working together to contribute to enormous, um, enormous impacts on the ocean that honestly, the only reason we're not talking about these impacts more, I think are simply because we're not dolphins. If, if we were dolphins, we'd be talking all about the ocean. We'd be barely mentioning what's happening on earth because like I just said, 93% of the extra heat being trapped inside the climate system by our heat trapping gas emissions is going into the ocean. So there is a huge impact. I mean, we are seeing zooplankton and phytoplankton species moving poleward at, you know, warp speed compared to terrestrial species to adapt, you know, to, to go to the, the areas where the optimal temperature is. Um, we are seeing massive degradation of coral reefs, but we're also seeing some very hopeful stories of people who are looking at preserving the genetic diversity of coral reefs, regrowing, um, yeah, you know, coral reefs in the lab and then um, s sending out the embryos into the reef to plant themselves, looking at uh, which strains of coral are most resistant to warmer temperatures and more acidic uh, water conditions and, and harvesting those and planting them to maintain the reef integrity. There's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in the area, but you have a good point. We should be talking more about the oceans and no surprise, we do have a global weirding episode specifically about the oceans for that reason, because I think we really do need to be aware of it because for many of us, especially the poorer countries, the ocean forms the base of our food chain. And remind everyone where they can find the global weirding videos. Yes, you can find the global weirding videos online on YouTube, just Google global weirding, or you can go to globalweirdingseries.com. And then of course we have our three reports. We have, and actually, you know what? I'm gonna share my screen with you one more time so everybody can see the three reports again. Um, we have, just a second here. All right. Uh, we have the first report, which is about the science. And that one says, um, you can find it science2017.globalchange.gov. And then we have the second report. And the second report is on the impacts, which is 
there we go. Here's volume two, which you can find online at nca2018.globalchange.gov. And then, of course, don't forget the soccer report. The soccer report is the one that talks specifically about the carbon cycle. And you can find that one online at carbon2018.globalchange.gov. Good, good deal, good deal. Uh, the, the questions keep coming in fast and furious, so I'll get to as many as we can. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the report that it, the Earth should be cooling uh, without the help or, or in influence of, of greenhouse gases from, from human impacts. What's the quick way to respond to that? How do we know that the Earth would be cooling otherwise? Mm -hmm. So, so one of my favorite little global waiting episodes is called It's Just a Natural Cycle, Isn't It? And in it, I go through all of the natural factors that have caused climate change in the past. So very briefly, we know that the sun's energy kind of goes up and down randomly over time, as well as having a regular 11-year sunspot cycle. But today, for the last few decades, the sun's energy has been going down. So according to the sun, we should be getting cooler right now, not warmer. Then according to natural cycles like El Nino and the North Atlantic Oscillation and other natural cycles inside the climate system, all those cycles do is move heat around the climate system from east to west, north to south, atmosphere, ocean, and back again. Sometimes they can actually destroy a little bit of heat. Like during an El Nino, we have a very warm atmosphere, so some of that heat escapes out the top of the atmosphere. But natural cycles inside the climate system cannot create heat. That would violate conservation of energy. All they can do is move it around. So when we see that the atmosphere is warming, the only way it could be warming due to a natural cycle is if the ocean were cooling, like a seesaw or a teeter-totter. But actually, the atmosphere is warming this much, the ocean is warming by this much, so it can't be a natural cycle. Then we look at the natural cycles that cause the ice ages, and according to orbital cycles, we should be heading into the next ice age sometime in the next 15 years, not getting warmer. And then people say, well, what about volcanoes? Volcanoes do produce heat-trapping gases, but they're only a tiny fraction of what humans produce. And volcanic eruptions, of course, um, produce uh, aerosols that actually cool the planet for a couple months to a year after a really big eruption. So when we look at all the natural factors, they all have a perfect alibi. Um, I just saw a quick question from Kathy about recording the session. So I've learned the hard way, Kathy, that sometimes these web recordings don't always work great. So what I've just done is I've recorded this on my own computer. So I've recorded my audio and my video and my slides on my own computer with Adobe Presenter, and then I'm going to edit them together, not today. It'll take me a little while. I have to do a TED Talk first, and I haven't memorized it yet. Um, but later this week, yeah, I haven't even finished writing it yet, but don't tell anybody that. Um, hopefully nobody from TED is listening. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, edit the slides and the audio and the video together, and I'll put it on YouTube, and then anybody can watch it and share. And we're recording it here as well. Every time we've done this, it's been fine. So, okay. uh, you know, it's always good to have it in, in multiple places just to be safe. Uh, we have talked a lot about the oceans and they are obviously of paramount importance. But for when you go to areas, let's see, in the in interior parts of the United States, which really don't have much of an interest in the oceans, what are some of the topics you use uh, to discuss the, discuss the situation with them? Oh, yeah. Well, again, you have to figure out what matters to people. So if we're in the Midwest, we should talk about agriculture or the Great Lakes or what's happening in the big cities. Um, if we live in Texas, water is the issue. We either have too much or we have not enough, but it's never anywhere in between. Um, if we live in the Southwest, air quality is already a huge problem, as is drought and sea level rise. So basically, climate change hits us right in our Achilles heel. We look at the things that people already care about in the places where they live, and nine times out of 10, those are the exact ways that climate change is already affecting us. Okay, uh, back to tipping points briefly, because this is one I'm also curious about. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about the risk of methane hydrates being released? I know this is a little bit deep, but this is, <laughs> this is something a lot of people are curious about who are kind of a little deeper into this. Well, I absolutely can talk about that because I wrote that section of the report. Um, yes, uh, before uh, today, I work mostly on regional climate impacts, but my original research was on methane. In fact, I'm just getting ready to write a methane review paper now that we finally got the National Climate Assessment off, off the desk. Um, and what we know about methane is that enormous amounts of methane are already leaking out of the permafrost. 
as the permafrost thaws, all the decayed organic material in the land that, that was decaying and, and producing carbon and methane that would just remain trapped in the soil, as it thaws, it's being released into the atmosphere. And this is increasing as more and more permafrost thaws. And this is one of the significant vicious cycles in the climate system where a certain amount of human-induced warming invokes an even larger amount of uh, natural warming in response. What most people are concerned about, though, when they say methane hydrates, though, is not the methane and carbon trapped in permafrost, but rather what's trapped under the continental shelf in the Arctic Ocean. So it turns out that under the continental shelf, there is a huge amount of methane trapped in a frozen state called hydrates. And for a long time, in fact, five years ago, when I wrote a, a natural methane sources report from the EPA. At that time, I wrote the geologic methane chapter. There was a handful of papers on geologic methane emissions, and none of them speculated that the hydrate emissions would ever be released in a warming climate. In fact, they speculated that the only time that they were released was during ice ages because the sea level was so low that it released the pressure on the hydrates. So the hydrates could actually come out of the continental shelf during periods of very low sea level. Fast forward a few years, and two independent teams, one Russian and one American, actually measured methane leaking out of the continental shelves, out of the hydrates in the Arctic. So this led to very breathless headlines, you know, $80 trillion worth of damage due to, you know, leaking methane hydrates. But I have to put a break on that for two reasons. First of all, the methane was not measured to be reaching the atmosphere. It was coming out of the, out of the continental shelf into the water, but it was being absorbed by the water. The second thing is that we have no observations showing that this is changing. So it has to be increasing for us to know that it's happening due to a warming planet. Of course, the Arctic Ocean is increasing, but is the temperature at that depth increasing enough to actually thaw the base? A lot of people are thinking, well, not yet. It could happen in the future, but we haven't measured an increase yet. So well, methane hydrates are absolutely a concern, and well, people are starting to keep a very close eye on them, and while we did talk about them in the National Climate Assessment, Volume 1, Chapter 15, the biggest concern right now is the not-so-sexy concern, but a really real one, which is the fact that it's coming out of the permafrost, and you can measure it. If you want to see something crazy, go to YouTube and look for videos from the University of Alaska from a professor there. Her last name is Walter. I think it's Katie Walter. She goes out to frozen lakes that have bubbles of methane trapped in the ice because the methane's leaking out the lake bed and gets trapped in the ice. And she and her students take a, a steel rod and they put a hole in the ice and they have a lighter and they light the gas on fire as it comes out of the ice because methane, of course, is natural gas. In my opinion, I would have like a little thing rigged up with a fish there. And so you just put a couple of holes and you cook the fish. Anyways, look for those videos on YouTube if you wanna know more about methane that really is happening right here today. All right, we're getting close to the bottom of the hour. One more question before we wrap up. Uh, how can coastal marshes help to sink CO2 from the atmosphere and back into the soil? Well, not only can they do that, first of all, but they can also protect the coastline against erosion. And a big part of why our coastlines are so vulnerable is because of the loss of coastal wetlands to development, as well as, of course, to runoff and pollution and silting and sedimentation and all that stuff. So any type of regrowth of any plant material takes carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's why a lot of strategies, and I want to kind of sneak in this extra one too, because it's one of my favorite topics, a lot of really good strategies like regenerative agriculture are really important. If you're not familiar with Project Drawdown, go check it out right now, because it goes through and it lists all the different things that we can do to fix climate, which I love because there's no one thing that works, but there's a lot of really cool stuff. And regenerative agriculture, um, agricultural techniques to actually store the carbon in the soil where we want it, where it's really good for us and good for the soil and good for agriculture, is one of their top things, as is the education of women and girls, which I think is awesome too. So if you want to learn more about how agriculture can really help us, it won't fix the problem entirely, but it can take care of a big chunk. It's estimated I think I saw somewhere between 20 and 25%, which is pretty big. Um, check out Project Drawdown because it gets a lot more into the solutions than the National Climate Assessment was able to. That is a, a fantastic resource. Thank you very much. Bernadette's just over here on my side. Bernadette, you want to jump in real quick? I've been very patient with my <laughs> questions. Has. There's so many people. Oh. Um, and thank you guys for all your questions. There's been some great ones coming in. One that really stood out to me, you cover such a wide range of topics and speak so eloquently to so many of them. From your involvement in this report, what is the most undertold story that we're not telling, whether it's your chapter or the entire report? 
I think that the, the story that we're not telling is that climate change is already affecting us today. Even if we don't know it is, wherever we live in the US, it is no longer a future issue. It's not an Arctic issue. It is actually here today. And for every single place in the United States, we can put our finger on something that is changing, something that's happening in the places where we live, whether it's the types of, of insects and, and birds and animals and plants that are arriving in our backyard, whether it's the increased risk of, of severe weather and climate events, um, whether it's the fact that we're seeing sunny day flooding and octopuses floating around in parking garages in South Miami. Wherever we live, we can now tell a story of how climate change is already affecting us in the places where we live. Well, thank you, Catherine, so much for everything today. Yes, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you have been swamped ever since, well, you know, all the time, but especially since Friday. Yes, uh, one last question. Yes. Tell everybody you did an interview on a plane yeah. this past yeah. week. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I did. So, so all day Friday was just straight interviews, but I was on my way back from Thanksgiving with my in-laws where I had spent most of the time at Thanksgiving um, proofing the, the national climate assessment while simultaneously making pies with my other hand. Uh, so, so I'm on the plane on the way back and CBC, which is the Canadian broadcasting company, very near and dear to my heart. That's the station I listen to. They emailed and they said, well, we really like to interview you, but it has to be for the five o'clock news. And so I said, well, you know, I'm 30,000 feet up in the air on a plane. I can't exactly talk to you. And they're like, well, let's try this. <laughs> what if you put your jacket over your head to make a little mini sound booth? Yes, I really did this in the plane. And what if you recorded your answers on voice memo and then you sent them to us? I did it and it worked. That is fantastic. That is I wish incredible. we had a picture of that one. Yeah, that, that'd be a really <laughs> good one to see. That'd be a really good one to see. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank much. you. I want to share a few more, a few more notes before we, uh, before we close everything out. Hold on just for a moment, and we'll go back to my screen. Let's see. That's yours. There's mine. Hang on. Hold on just a moment. I'm going to put my links here in the chat room so people can actually connect to them directly if they want to. All right. Oops, there we go. Hang on just a second. Let me get my screen back. Well, that's yours. Here we go. Now that one is yours. Tell you what, well, let me just uh, let me just wrap this up as, as we get to the bottom of the hour. Um, for those of you who are, who are new uh, to Climate Central, I want to remind you that our Climate Matters program uh, delivers multimedia. Uh, an analysis to cover science and impacts at local, national, and global levels, uh, like what we released last week. You can get these materials by signing up at medialibrary.climatecentral.org. I'm going to say that again. Climate, excuse me, media library at climatecentral.org. For some reason, I cannot find my slides. Uh, I still have your slides, but that's all right. We're wrapping up and everything's going to be all right. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for spending time with us this afternoon. Bernie, anything else? No, thank you so much for your time and all your effort on this. And again, everybody, we do a ton of localized climate analyses on a range of topics. We had a whole communications package on this specific event alone, the National Climate Assessment and some of the backgrounders. So if you go to our website, you can find a ton of information to help tell these climate change stories and get even more as we go forward. All right. So thank you all very much. Uh, have a great afternoon and we will see you next time. Thanks everybody.